Howdy folks, and welcome to part 8 of my comprehensive guide to PFSense 2.3. In this video, I want to go over the firewall and uh, NAT rules. So, in this video, uh, I want to start off by talking about what a firewall really is. Now, I know this might seem quite trivial, but um, with all of the new products on the market and, uh, you know, corporate marketing and things, uh, the line between what a firewall is and you know what it can and can't do is kind of blurred. So I want to just sort of clarify that before we go any further. I also want to explain, of course, PFSense uh, rule sets and uh, how how they work. And uh, I'm going to give some tips on how to write firewall rules. And then I'm going to go over configuring those rules uh, in the PFSense web GUI. And I'm also going to go over configuring NAT rules in the web GUI as well. I'm not going to go over the theory of NAT um, because I've already done that in a previous video. So we need to begin by defining what a firewall really does. And basically a firewall controls traffic flow between two networks based on layer 3 and layer 4 information primarily. So we're talking about the ISO slash you know, OSI uh, networking model. And so layers 3 and 4 correspond with the IP and transport layers. And these sort of, uh, the, the control of traffic flow decisions are made by what are known as firewall rules. And these rules uh, generally perform one of three primary actions on a particular traffic flow. The first one is known as pass, and this one is uh, quite trivial. Uh, it allows traffic to pass from one network to the other unobstructed um, as normal. The second one is known as reject, and reject will drop all packets of that traffic flow, uh, i.e. they're deleted, they're not allowed to proceed to their destination network. And depending on the protocol, whether it's uh, TCP or UDP, uh, somehow the sender of those packets is alerted that uh, the connection could not be made, that the, the traffic flow uh, was not uh, successful. And the third action is known as block. And it's similar to reject in that the packets are dropped and they're not able to make their way uh, to the destination network. However, they are dropped silently. There is no alert, there is no uh, response to the sender uh, to indicate that uh, the connection was not successful. In PFSense, the firewall is provided by the packet filter uh, application, or known as PF, and this is where the PF in PFSense comes from. Now in PFSense, firewall rules can also do a couple of other things. Uh, they can mark traffic flows. So basically they can flag particular types of traffic uh, for use by other packages uh, or other uh, firewall rules, which ultimately will then apply one of those three previous rules I've already gone over. Um, for example, the traffic shaper uses uh, uh, marks a lot um, in order to identify what types of traffic uh, to shape. So the firewall doesn't actually shape the traffic. Uh, it simply identifies a traffic and then the traffic shaper, which is separate, will then uh, use that information uh, to alter traffic flows. You can also log traffic flows. Um, so basically you can uh, record when particular types of connections get made. And so you can use this for diagnostic purposes, uh, among other things. And I'll also just mention that uh, these types of actions, they don't alter the, the pass block reject type decisions, because uh, ultimately one of those has to be made for every packet. Um, whether you log it or you flag it, it doesn't change uh, the behavior of other rules which have one of those three primary actions uh, associated with them. So the basic idea uh, behind a firewall is that first, uh, you know, a packet that's part of a new connection arrives at a particular interface uh, on the, uh, the, the firewall, the box with the firewall on it. And the firewall rules are checked against that packet uh, one at a time in a particular order. And once a rule is found that matches that particular packet, the action that is uh, listed in that rule is taken on that packet and rule matching at that point stops. And there's a little asterisk there. I'll get back to that in a moment. And in the event that you go through all of the rules, no rule matches, in that case, the packet is blocked by default. That is the default action that is taken if nothing matches. So you might be wondering uh, what the difference between block and reject is. Of course, they're quite similar. So what, when would you want to use you know, one over the other? 
And the simple rule of thumb is that if you don't know, use block. And uh, the reason is because reject, like I sort of mentioned earlier, reject either sends a TCP reset in the event of a TCP connection, or if you're using UDP, it sends an ICMP port unreachable message back to the sender um, as soon as yeah, the connection attempt is made. And so um, this could be dangerous. Um, it could alert an attacker um, that there's a firewall that's at a particular IP address, and it could encourage them to probe for um, you know, vulnerabilities. For example, if you're on the internet, let's say you have a, a, a firewall which acts as a gateway for a network, so therefore it has a WAN interface and a LAN interface. On the WAN interface, if you uh, set up uh, reject instead of block, if some attacker is scanning for some vulnerability on some port and they come across your IP address, they send a, a connection attempt, and even if you don't have that service, they're going to get a response immediately back from your firewall saying, you know, you can't do that. And so now the attacker knows that there is something that is responding at that IP address. And so the attacker may now want to uh, scan all the ports, maybe, because it knows it's going to get an immediate response for anything that is closed. Whereas if you used block, uh, eventually the attacker, you know, the attacker would just send a packet and they'd never get a response. And so they don't know if there is something there that's just not responding or if there's nothing at that IP address at all. And so there's a lot less incentive to, um, you know, attack something. Again, it, it, it's not real security, but it, it helps. And so, of course, the general rule of, th rule of thumb, of course, is to never, ever use reject on a, an internet public-facing uh, interface like a WAN. Now, reject will result in a faster failure for applications which try to make connections because instead of having to wait and time out um, like they would if you used block, they will immediately, you know, within one round trip time over the network, they will get a, you know, a TCP reset or a port unreachable message, and therefore the application knows that the connection was refused. So um, it, it could be sort of nicer. Uh, you may get better error messages and things like that um, if you use reject. So generally, uh, reject, in my opinion, it, it can be useful across like private subnet boundaries. So if you have maybe a, a, a more secure subnet in your organization, it's not secret. But, uh, you know, it, it, it has uh, more restrictions applied upon it. Um, you know, if you have some piece of software that accidentally tries to talk over, you know, talk through a firewall, um, it may be beneficial to use reject in a situation like that because you'll get better error messages. It'll make more sense. So now I want to go over the rule sets that you'll find in PFSense. So first of all, every interface um, on your PFSense box has a separate rule set um, which is applicable for incoming traffic. So traffic that comes into the PFSense box from that interface. So for example, the WAN will have one, your LAN will have them, any optional interfaces, wireless interfaces, all of those will have a separate rule set for traffic that enters the box from those interfaces. Every VPN will have an, a rule set for incoming traffic. So for example, things like OpenVPN, IPsec, they have their virtual interfaces and therefore they will have their own rule sets. Every interface group that you've defined has its own rule set as well. There are also what are known as floating rules. And of course, the NAT port forwarding rules uh, also make up uh, their own set as well. And there is also uh, sort of every service that runs on the box can insert its own set of firewall rules. So if you have uh, packages that you've installed, um, they, of course, can insert their own rules, and these are automatically inserted. They're not usually user configurable, but they, are, of course, they do exist as well. And so ordering is uh, very important. And so these rules uh, are evaluated in the following order. First of all, uh, you have your NAT rules. So they are uh, evaluated first. They are attempted to be matched first uh, on uh, new incoming traffic. Following that are the service rules, the automatically added service rules. Uh, next, after that, we have the floating rule set. Then we have both the interface group rules and the VPN rules. They have actually they actually have the same precedence because technically the VPN rules are interface groups. Uh, and then last but not least, we have the interface rules. Now, of course, I've talked about floating rules. You know, what are floating rules? 
Well, they are a special type of more advanced uh, rule that can match traffic in multiple directions and potentially across multiple interfaces. So just, just, just like each interface has its own rule set for incoming traffic, floating rules have the ability to match outgoing traffic as well. And you can have a floating rule which matches traffic across potentially all of the interfaces in the box. So if you don't want to create a separate rule for each interface, you could create a floating rule which covers all of them. You could also create an interface group and then create a rule on that interface group, which would then work across all interfaces. But um, focusing on floating rules, um, it's simply a, a more advanced way to do uh, to write rules. And you don't need floating rules. Um, most networks don't need them. Um, you you can probably get away without them. Um, however, they can they can reduce the amount of configuration you need um, for certain situations, but they will in, sort of increase the complexity of uh, your your firewall rules because uh, they, they, they are a little bit different than others. Um, if you use the traffic shaper, you will probably see a large number of floating rules that get automatically created by the traffic shaper. And that's because the traffic shaper uses floating rules to match uh, traffic flows, which it then shapes. So one thing that's special about floating rules is that floating rules can be overridden by rules in other rule sets which follow the floating rule set. And so this, this is very unique. This is that asterisk that I talked about um, when I said that rule matching stops after, uh, a, after a match is found. That is true in all cases except for the floating rules. Now floating rules, they work in, in a weird way where they, they are matched relatively early. However, they act in a last match manner. So if I have a particular traffic flow and there exists a rule for that flow, uh, there, there exists a floating rule for that traffic flow, if there's no other rules that match that, then of course the floating rule will be the successful match and that action will be taken. However, if on the other hand, I have a floating rule which matches that traffic flow and I also have an interface rule which matches that traffic flow, even though the interface rule is, is evaluated later, that rule is the one, uh, is, the, is the interface rule that will uh, ultimately have its action taken. So basically floating rules are only, uh, their, their action is only taken if there is no other rule following it which matches the traffic as well. And you can override this. You can basically uh, create a floating rule which behaves in the normal sense where it's a first match man, uh, in a first match manner where as soon as a match occurs, that action is taken and rule matching stops. You can uh, override this sort of weird behavior by enabling what's known as the quick option. And I'll show you that in the, uh, the web GUI. And you can specify that on a per rule basis. So you can have some floating rules which are quick and therefore they match first. And you can also have some floating rules um, which are sort of default and they work in a last match manner. So now I want to move on to uh, a few tips for writing firewall rules. Now the first and foremost uh, is that order matters. This is one of the biggest uh, problems I see uh, with people who are you know, just starting out writing firewall rules. Generally they write the rules correctly but they put them in the wrong order and therefore they have weird unexpected behavior. Now of course the rules are checked one at a time, and they're checked in order from first to last. Both, you know, each rule set is checked in a particular order, but the rules within each rule set are checked within a particular order. And since the rule checking stops after the first match, you know, except for floating rules, um, the rule that you want might never actually be checked if something, uh, you know, before that rule uh, also happens to match your traffic, which maybe you weren't expecting. The general rule is to always order your rules from most specific to most general. So basically, the more criteria that your rule matches on, the higher it should be up the rule list. And that way, you don't end up in a situation where a general sort of blanket rule um, matches before some very specific rule, which may you know override that uh, that sort of default for that class of traffic. And uh, if you follow this and you really get and you know, you actually get the ordering correct between specific and general, uh, you should be good like 95% of the time. So just a few things to mention if your rule is not working. Um, first, ensure that the rule is listed on the incoming interface. So make sure the interface is right uh, because every interface has separate rules. And of course, if the rule is on the wrong interface, it will never be checked. 
You should also ensure that there's no interface group rules that also match your traffic because interface groups are evaluated before interfaces. And so uh, you could have uh, some sort of weird general rule, uh, which is uh, match matching your traffic and that could be causing your undesired behavior. And you should also check uh, whether there are no you know, quick floating rules that also match your traffic. Regular floating rules should be fine, but quick floating rules, uh, again, they will override uh, your interface rules. And so you'll want to make sure uh, that there are none, or uh, if there are, make sure that they're specific enough that they don't match your traffic. So one thing to note is that firewall rules apply to connections and not to individual packets. Um, so the firewall rules are evaluated when a new connection is created. Um, and then if the, uh, if the action that is taken is to pass the traffic, a new state is created in the state table and the firewall rules are not evaluated again um, for that state. And so if you add a new block or reject rule for traffic which was previously allowed to pass, it won't sever any existing connections because there's, there's already a state in the state table for that connection. It's already been allowed. Um, and therefore, um, you know, you can have connect, even if you add, you know, a block rule, existing open connections will stay open until they're closed. And normally this isn't that big of a deal, but uh, if it's uh, concerning or, you know, you need to kill those states, um, you can uh, reset the state table or you can uh, manually go in and uh, to the state table and just delete the states that you want. If you go and reset the whole state table, just uh, you know, understand that you're gonna be severing all the connections on the firewall. So that's kind of a destructive operation. You might not want to do that. So this next point is quite important. I've had people come to me with this problem several times. Uh, basically, by default on PFSense, all optional interfaces have no rules by default. So if you create an optional interface, you know, i.e. it's not the WAN or LAN that's automatically created when you run the setup wizard, there are no rules whatsoever on that interface. And therefore, all traffic will be blocked by default because if there's no matching rule to pass traffic, block is the action that is automatically applied. Which means that if you create, you know, you, have a, you, add, an, you, add, a, you add a network card, you, let's say you want to make a wireless network or a separate wired network, if you do that, uh, you, you won't be able to get data um, from th that network to the to any other network because all traffic that's coming into the fire uh, coming into the firewall coming into the pfSense box through that interface will be blocked so you'll have maybe one directional communication which of course doesn't work and so you know you'll I've had people say I, I've added an interface and it doesn't pass any traffic it doesn't work well it's because you have to add uh, a rule uh, at least one rule to pass traffic from that interface. So as I've mentioned before, by default, all unmatched traffic flows are blocked on an interface. And this is known as the whitelist approach, where all traffic is blocked by default and you have to explicitly pass any traffic that you want to enter through an interface. And this is very useful for uh, things like WAN interfaces, because of course, um, you know, you don't want just anything from the internet getting into your network. You want to be able to explicitly allow only a few select types of connections into your network and everything else should be blocked. Now you can invert this behavior by adding what's sort of known as an allow to all rule at the end of your interface rule set. And so basically, if no rule matches your traffic, it will be allowed by default. And this is of course known as the blacklist approach where basically you have to explicitly um, block or reject traffic um, with your firewall rules, everything else is allowed. And this is useful for LAN interfaces because um, generally speaking, there's gonna be a large number of applications on your network that are gonna to wanna to make different types of connections out into the, you know, let's say the, the internet, for example. And you're not gonna be able to really know all of those uh, applications and all of those types of connections. And so therefore, it makes more sense to simply block things you don't want and assume everything else is okay. Now, it is possible um, I mean, it is possible for you to blacklist on a WAN and whitelist on a LAN. There's nothing that's going to stop you from doing that. However, it's going to be uh, very hard if you choose to use a whitelist approach on LAN interfaces because you're going to have to be able to profile every single piece of software you have um, to make sure that, you know, it will operate correctly. 
Um, the advantage to doing that, of course, would be that if you have some sort of worm or malware that gets into your network, um, it may not be able to communicate data out of your network because uh, you know, you've blocked everything by default. And I don't recommend using the blacklist approach on a WAN interface. That's uh, kind of stupid. So now I want to move on to the web interface and I'll go over the details of firewall rules uh, in the interface itself. So this is my virtualized PFSense uh, system which I've used for this video series in the past. I have simply updated it to the current release which is 2.3.4 at the time of recording. Now of course this VM, its WAN is connected to my actual, uh, my actual LAN which of course has another uh, PFSense router to the internet. So this is a double NATed environment. I've had a couple people ask me some questions about why the WAN interface is, uh, of course, on a private network, and that's because uh, this uh, does not actually talk directly to the internet. It's uh, just a demo box for doing uh, these videos. And as a result, it's very got very minimal configuration in it. It's just what's needed um, to be able to uh, show you what's going on. Of course, I wouldn't be using this kind of a CPU in a regular router. So before I talk about the firewall rules, I want to go over a few other things uh, which you'll find associated with the firewall which are uh, useful to know beforehand. The first thing is aliases. Now, oftentimes you're going to find yourself writing uh, a number of firewall rules which use the same IP address or port uh, in multiple places. And uh, there's nothing wrong with doing this. However, if that IP address were to change, you would have to manually go through every single rule that uses that IP address and change it. And of course that can be quite labor intensive. So instead, uh, a really good idea is to create uh, an alias. Uh, basically where you enter in the IP address uh, and then you give it a name and this can be any string. And uh, of course I recommend always putting a description whenever uh, you can. And uh, therefore when you're uh, asked for an IP address uh, when you're writing a firewall rule, simply enter the name instead of the IP address. And then you can uh, basically, if you want to ever update that IP address, you just have to change, uh, you just have to edit the alias, uh, change the address once, and then all of the rules uh, that reference that alias will automatically be updated. So it can make things uh, substantially faster uh, to update. Now, you can do this for IPs, uh, and you can do this as well for ports, and you can also do it uh, for networks as well. They all work in a similar fashion. You'll also notice uh, that there are these URL options here. Now the URL options uh, for IPs and ports, basically the way this works is you give an IP address and uh, when you hit save, uh, PFSense will download uh, basically a plain text file, it's, it's expecting a plain text list at that address of a bunch of uh, IP addresses or ports. And it will then create a bunch of aliases based off of uh, that, uh, that list. And this is a one-time event and you can, you, know, you can add as many URLs uh, to fetch these lists from as many places as you want. And the URL table works uh, basically in the same way. It looks for a you know, plain text file in a similar fashion. However, you can specify an update frequency. So uh, you could have it, for example, you know, automatically once every week, you could have it refetch uh, that list. And so if you have other services on your network that can generate this sort of uh, textual list of IP addresses or ports, you can automatically uh, update your firewall rules uh, by setting up an alias that uses them. Um, of course, this is really only useful on larger networks, but um, the feature exists. Another thing to mention uh, are schedules. And schedules are sort of exactly like uh, as they sound. You can specify uh, a time range or date range and you can then associate this schedule with uh, one or more firewall rules. And so therefore the rule will be automatically uh, disabled whenever uh, the current date and time is outside of uh, that schedule. So for example, uh, you could create a schedule called like let's say day for example, and you could have it you know, start uh, in the morning and you know, end uh, at some time at night. And then you could have another schedule called night, which is maybe the opposite of that, just looking at the time alone. And therefore, you could have some firewall rules which you would attribute with the day schedule and some you attribute with the night schedule or some you attribute with you know, weekends and, and things like that. And therefore, certain rules can be automatically enabled and disabled at different time periods. And so therefore, um, you can sort of, you know, for example, even if, like say, traffic shaping on, for example, um, maybe you want to do different traffic shaping um, during peak hours 
versus uh, non-peak hours. Well, you would you could have different uh, match rules uh, on different schedules, and you can set up uh, schedules um, through this. It's very simple. You can simply pick dates um, and, and times. It's uh, relatively straightforward. So now I want to talk about firewall rules. And you'll notice that at the top here, we have tabs for each of the interfaces uh, on our box. So in this case, I have the WAN, the LAN, and uh, I've created an optional interface, which I didn't bother to rename. And you'll also see a tab for the floating rules, which I mentioned earlier. Of course, this is sort of a demo machine. It doesn't actually have any firewall rules in it other than what was created when I installed PFSense. So all of the rules uh, should be uh, completely uh, sort of automatically added. Um, and you can see here, by default, uh, there is a Bogon uh, network block, um, which is uh, inserted here on the WAN. So basically, uh, I think I mentioned this uh, in a previous video, that basically there is a list that you can have PFSense automatically download uh, on some schedule. It's usually once a month. And it contains uh, IP addresses on the internet that are, not res that are basically not assigned to anyone. And therefore, um, you should never be able to receive a packet uh, from one of those addresses. So basically, uh, all this rule simply states is that if uh, a packet comes in from one of those addresses, it gets blocked. And so that's all that's being done here. Uh, the LAN will have uh, a couple rules depending on how what you specified when you did the installation. Um, there's what's known as the anti-lockout rule, and this basically uh, prevents you from writing a rule, which um, you'll notice that this rule is is first. And you'll notice that it doesn't have the ability for you to move it. So I can re reorder the other rules, but I can't move this rule and I can't edit it. And this rule is locked as the first rule here. And the idea is that uh, it prevents you from writing a rule which would block or reject or, or, or basically prevent you from accessing the web GUI. Um, which or, or the SSH in that in that if, if you've enabled the SSH console, so it prevents you from uh, basically sort of self-bricking the device, um, and so it's uh, it's you can turn this off if you want uh, in the uh, in the system settings, but I recommend uh, leaving that on at all times unless you absolutely need a reason to get rid of it. And you also notice that there are uh, these automatic rules that are added, one for IPv4 and one for IPv6, and these are the allow to any rules. So these perform. Uh, basically the, the inversion that I talked about. These ones are wildcard rules and they allow uh, basically any traffic that uh, originates on the LAN to go to any, uh, basically anywhere else. Um, so this allows you to make connections out to the WAN, for example, or to make connections into the, the optional interface. But you'll notice that the optional interface, I haven't set up any rules. In fact, you'll even say uh, what I mentioned earlier, that uh, there can be no traffic that, can, that is allowed to come in on this interface. So even if the LAN sent a packet um, you know, by this rule into the optional interface, the optional interface has no way of sending traffic back to the LAN unless we added such a rule. So let's, uh, let's actually uh, work towards adding a rule to do that first of all. So of course, we can add uh, rules based uh, basically at the beginning or at the end. In this case, it doesn't really matter which one we choose. And so, of course, the action is exactly uh, as I mentioned earlier. You have your three options, pass, block, or reject. So uh, we're going to want, we're creating an allow to all rule. So we're going to want to pass traffic. You can selectively en enable or disable rules. Um, so, of course, you can disable it without deleting it in case you want to enable it later. Of course, the interface uh, that the traffic is coming in on, of course, is our optional interface. Um, and uh, I'm just going to deal with IPv4. Like I said, this, this entire series, I'm not talking about IPv6, um, so I'm just going to leave that. And so if it's going to be a, uh, a sort of allow all, um, we're going to want to match any protocol. And uh, that gets rid of a decent number of options. And we don't really care uh, where it's coming from or where it's going to. We're just going to allow uh, anything. And uh, we're not going to log this uh, traffic because that would be a terrible idea. And so now, um, you know, we could add a description uh, or advanced options. But if I don't do anything and I just uh, leave it the way it is, you'll now notice that basically any traffic um, that arrives on this interface destined anywhere um, is allowed to pass. And uh, when you make a change to the uh, firewall rules, uh, they don't immediately get applied. Um, they only get applied after you uh, reload the configuration of the firewall. And so this way, you have the ability to add multiple rules before any of them uh, take effect. So uh, you can, you can you know, make several changes and then ensure that they're right, you know, review your changes 
before you make them go live. So now, uh, now that I have this rule here, uh, I should be able to basically pass anything uh, in between these two networks as well as this network um, to the WAN as well. So now that we've inserted this apply to all for this interface, I want to uh, go in and show you uh, adding a rule for a little bit more of a general case. Now you'll notice that I always want to now add rules to the top of the list because of course I want them to precede uh, this rule. Now of course action is relatively straightforward. This is all very straightforward. Uh, protocol, uh, realistically speaking, you're going to want to know, uh, I mean this goes for pretty much anything on this page, you're going to want to know what kind of traffic you're matching before you even get to this page. Um, you should know the protocol, the ports, um, you should know this because uh, it's not a game of whack-a-mole. I mean, you, you, you need to know what traffic you're matching and it's going to be basically, you know, writing a rule is uh, done on a case-by-case -case basis. So I can't help you identify the traffic that you're going to be matching. Um, and so I, I highly recommend you, 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 you definitely know the answers to these questions before uh, you get to this stage. Um, because otherwise, uh, you know, guess and, guess and check is not a very effective way of writing firewall rules. Your protocol is probably going to be either TCP or UDP, uh, but I don't recommend just, you know, selecting this or, or selecting any. Uh, I don't recommend doing that. Um, I recommend knowing what it is and being as specific as you can be on the protocol. Generally speaking, um, that's another tip. Try and be as specific as you can on your uh, on your firewall rules, so that way um, you have less chance of that rule um, matching other traffic that it's not supposed to match um, in the future. It just it just helps you with uh, troubleshooting stuff. And then you have uh, basically your matches on source and destination. Um, you'll notice that the destination has the port range specified here, whereas in the source it's actually considered an advanced option. And the reason is because for most connections, the source port is an ephemeral port. It's basically just some random port value, and therefore matching on it is uh, quite difficult. In, in fact, in most cases it's impossible uh, or it's not helpful. But you may have some weird situation where you want to match it, so it is, of course, provided. And basically for the source and destination, of course, this is, um, you know, where it comes from and where it's going to. You can basically match based on either, you know, a single host uh, or alias. So that's basically, a, you know, an alias would be something that we entered earlier um, or uh, an IP address, uh, just a single address. It could also be uh, any of the subnetworks for the, uh, that basically are, are available uh, from the firewall. So in this case, you know, we have our three interfaces and so therefore we could basically specify those um, there's just placeholders here. And these these sort of LAN net, WAN net, these all uh, are just like aliases, so they don't actually add an address here. So if we were to change, uh, you know, the, the, the network uh, for our, our, our LAN or WAN or whatever, um, all of the rules that are specified for that will carry over after the change. So if we, for example, picked LAN net and we changed um, the, the architecture of the LAN, um, we wouldn't have to re-enter all that stuff in. So again, these work like aliases, and I recommend you use those rather than trying to enter in, you know, a, a network manually. Um, that's generally not uh, not well advised. And of course, the port range you can specify a port directly um, from the list if it's some sort of common uh, port, or you can use the other, in which case you can specify uh, you can type in the beginning and end port ranges. And of course, if you're using only one uh, port, you only have to enter in uh, one and uh, the other one is sort of assumed to be the same. Um, you can log packets, uh, like I've mentioned earlier, you can log them. Um, and I don't recommend logging everything, realistically speaking. I would only use that if you're trying to maybe block something in particular and you want to know when it's been blocked or if you're trying to do some debugging, but I recommend um, not logging uh, a large number of packets. Uh, it's uh, not a great idea to leave that option on for very long. I always, always, re always recommend you put a description for every rule that you have because you're going to come back to your firewall in a year and you're going to see a rule and you're going to have absolutely no idea what it does or what it's for. So I recommend you put in a short description of what it does, maybe what hosts it is used for or what services or programs or whatever. Um, things like the date when the rule is added is automatically um, stored uh, PFSense automatically keeps that, so you'll at least know you know when you created it. But uh, I, I always put in a host name and a service or something like that. 
Uh, advanced options are generally not needed, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll go over some of them here. Uh, there's so much stuff to deal with the firewall that, and, and I, I definitely won't be going over everything in this video uh, because there's just so much stuff and I don't want to confuse people because most people are not going to need a lot of the options. Of course, you can uh, attempt to uh, filter by source operating system for TCP. Um, you know, you, your mileage may vary uh, using that. Diff serve code point, basically this has to do with the quality of service field in the IP packet header. Um, diff, diff serve uh, replaced uh, the TOS. Um, and so basically there's six bits in the header that um, you can uh, match on. Uh, PFSense can uh, read these. It currently can't set them or change them, um, but you can, you can match on some quality of service fields. Uh, again, you know, only if you know what these are should you even bother to try and use them. Um, you can tag or um, have, basically, uh, you can do policy filtering with PFSense. So basically, you can enter in uh, sort of a, a string here, and then that packet will be sort of flagged uh, with that tag. And then any other rule that has that same string in the tagged field will uh, act as a match, assuming all the other fields are also matches. So you can basically sort of cascade rules that way by using this tag and tagged field. Um, but again, that's more advanced routing that most people don't need. You can specify the maximum number of state table entries um, for all connections that this rule is uh, basically corresponds to. Um, you can specify the maximum number of unique IP addresses um, for which states exist for this rule. Um, you can also limit the number of established connections. This only works with TCP, of course, because UDP is connectionless, so uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you can limit not only the number of states in total, but the number of states per host, per IP, and you can set a, a maximum connection rate for TCP, so basically how many connections in how many seconds, and you can also set a time of value uh, as well here. You can match on uh, specific TCP flags if you wish. You can prevent the rule from being synced, um, over PFSync, so um, between uh, sort of uh, failover uh, nodes. So uh, if you check this uh, and you do end up in a failover situation, uh, all states uh, will not uh, be copied over and therefore uh, they will all be, uh, all, the, all the connections basically will be terminated when you do a uh, failover. Now some of the most popular advanced options are actually right here at the bottom. Um, this is the schedule um, which allows you to, if you had created uh, a schedule uh, in the uh, the schedules uh, tab here, um, you would be able to select that schedule uh, from the drop down here, and therefore that rule would only be enabled on that particular schedule. Um, for gateway, if you have uh, a multi WAN situation, you can specify which uh, gateway the traffic comes in on for it to match this rule. Uh, if you only have one one WAN, then uh, there's no point in changing this option. And uh, if you have traffic shaping uh, enabled, um, this last option here, uh, at queue and queue, is quite useful. So you can specify which uh, queue and which acknowledgement queue um, this uh, traffic corresponds to. Um, again, in this case, uh, there are, there's no traffic shaping. Uh, but if, if you do do traffic shaping, um, you will see all of your uh, queues um, appear here, as well as uh, limiters and other things. So moving on to floating rules, um, you'll notice that if I just uh, try to add a floating rule here, you'll notice that the interface is similar, but it does have a few additional options. Uh, first of all, there's this quick option, which I mentioned earlier, and this is what allows you to uh, basically make the floating rule act like a regular rule instead of uh, on a last match basis. You'll also notice that there's the ability to select one or more than one interface uh, for the uh, rule to match on. You can also check, uh, you can also change the direction of the match. So uh, whereas all other rules are an in match, you can select an out match or a bi-directional match as well. All of the other options uh, are uh, basically exactly the same. And uh, lastly, there is uh, one more action available for floating rules, and that is match. And match doesn't uh, affect the, uh, the flow of the traffic, uh, but it does, of course, allow you to add uh, other sort of advanced parameters uh, like queues, for example, um, which is of course used by the traffic shaper and uh, potentially other packages.
Now, at least in my personal experience, I think when most people go into a firewall to do configuration, uh, they want to do configuration of NAT rules, not of firewall rules directly. Um, that's where most of the configuration happens. And if we go into NAT, uh, you'll notice the first tab is port forward. And I believe you know, that's, a, that's a term that I think most people have heard before uh, in other consumer equipment. And uh, uh, it works exactly the same way uh, in PFSense, but possibly with just a little bit more flexibility. So basically, port forwarding allows you to specify a port on your WAN, uh, which will be automatically directed to a particular uh, LAN IP. So of course, um, you can disable the rule as usual. Uh, the interface is generally going to be WAN because generally you're going to want to be doing port forwarding from your, your internet connected interface to your LAN interface. Uh, again, the protocol, you're going to want to know what this is, and you're going to want to be as specific as possible. Now, generally speaking, the source is uh, not uh, used because uh, we usually don't care where the traffic is coming from. However, you can uh, specify uh, a source address or port range if you wish. Um, if there is, you know, a, say, a one specific static IP on the Internet that you want to be able to make a connection that no other IP should be able to make, um, you, can, you can specify that if you wish. But generally, you're going to be looking at the destination. So normally the destination, of course, is going to be the WAN address because um, when packets come in, they're going to come in addressed to the gateway. And so that is the WAN address. What you're going to need to know, of course, is what port the connection is going to be made on. If you're running a web server, then you know it's going to be HTTP and HTTPS. Um, you know, if you're running some other type of server, uh, you know, it's going to have its own port. Um, if it's not in the list, then you can always just type it in, and it can also be a range as well, just like for firewall rules. The redirect target IP is going to be the LAN address of the machine, which is going to get that connection forwarded through to it. And the redirect target port is going to be the port um, which the connection uh, is made on across the LAN. And uh, one thing to note, of course, is that the destination port and the redirect target port do not have to be the same. So for example, if I have, let's say, an SSH server running um, you know, uh, on some LAN machine, I don't have to specify the SSH port here. In fact, I'd recommend you probably don't run an SSH server on port 22. That's probably a bad idea. So you could enter in some, you know, some weird, weird port and uh, Simply and then simply translate that the 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 firewall will translate that to uh, whatever port you want, so they don't have to match each other. Again, description: you can disable syncing of the rule. Uh, NAT reflection is uh, an interesting option, and uh, I think not enough people really know what this is. Um, if you have it set to use system default, um, you have to go into um, system advanced firewall and NAT. And uh, you'll find this option called NAT reflection, and uh, it's by default it's disabled, but uh, you can change the option here if you want. Um, just note that if you create rules that use, uh, you know, this whole use the system default, if you change this, it will apply to all of the rules that you've created up until that point if you've ignored this. Um, so you may or may not want um, to uh, change this. Basically, NAT reflection uh, refers to if you have. Uh, let's say you have a server on your LAN and you have uh, another machine on your LAN and uh, normally you know that other machine can access that server through its uh, LAN IP address just as a direct connection. However, if that server is let's say accessible over the internet, let's say you've created a, a port forward rule like this one um, which allows you to access it over the internet, then if you have some application which wants to access that server using the internet IP address, using the WAN address, you need NAT reflection in order for that to work. Because without NAT reflection, if this is disabled, then when, you, when that application tries to connect to the WAN address, um, the WAN address is technically the gateway address. It's the PFSense box address. And so uh, it's going to act like you're trying to connect to the PFSense box itself, which of course is probably going to be the, you know, that port's probably going to be blocked and it's just going to time out. So NAT reflection basically allows um, uh, the PFSense box to redirect that traffic um, from the LAN back to the LAN um, as if it were 
uh, coming from the uh, basically coming from the WAN. Um, and you can do this in one of two different methods, and uh, they're described uh, in the uh, advanced settings uh, for which one you would want. Which one you want to use and whether you actually want this at all is uh, basically entirely uh, situation dependent. I think that most people probably uh, don't need to ever bother with this uh, setting because uh, most people don't even know what it does. So this last option is filter rule association. And of course, when you create this NAT rule, there's going to be an associated rule created uh, in the firewall for it. And uh, you can create that as basically an associated rule or as an unassociated rule. So basically one that's either linked or not linked with it. So if I just finish this rule here by adding some arbitrary uh, redirect IP for just for my case, of course, you would know what this is. I'll give it a description and I'll save it. So you can see we have this new rule here, um, which corresponds to any TCP connection which comes in on the WAN, which is destined for the WAN address on port 33333 will get redirected to port 22 on uh, this LAN address. And uh, uh, this check mark, by the way, tells you that the rule is enabled. And uh, you can simply click this to disable or uh, re-enable a rule. So rather than going into you know, and editing the rule and then checking this box, it's much, much faster to just uh, click that. You also notice that there's this linked rule icon here. And it's telling us that there's a firewall rule that's managed by this rule. And uh, if we go into the firewall rules on the WAN, you'll notice that there is this new rule that we didn't create this. Uh, this was automatically created um, when we created that NAT rule. And so this is allowing um, our, our traffic to make its way to uh, port 22 on that LAN address. And you'll notice that the, you'll notice that the description is uh, the same as that of our uh, NAT rule. So it's got NAT in front of it. So uh, it's an easy way to see uh, the linked rule. Of course, we can add as many rules as we want. We can click and drag the rules to reorder them. Uh, we can edit them. And we can also create new rules uh, based on existing rules. So if I click that, it'll simply basically duplicate the rule. And then I can just, you know, if I just need to change one little thing, it's a lot easier than making a new rule and then filling all the blanks in. I can just sort of, sort of copy paste and modify uh, by doing that. Of course, we can also delete rules and you can add separators, which are just basically lines, um, which uh, give you a, a basically a description. Uh, and you can sort of classify, um, you can group your rules uh, and give them colors and, and things like that um, to help you organize this, you know, what ultimately will be a, a massive list of uh, seemingly unrelated rules. So the next tab is one-to-one -one NAT. And I'm not really going to be talking about this uh, very much because I don't think many people are going to uh, be using this because in order for this to work, you need to own a block of IP addresses on the internet. And of course, with IPv4 address depletion, really only large corporations have access to that. So really, in short, all this really does is it maps um, IP addresses on the internet that you have access to, to uh, a block of LAN addresses. And so therefore, um, traffic that arrives on each of those internet IPs goes to its corresponding LAN IP. The next tab is outbound NAT. And uh, again, I'm going to sort of gloss over this because I think most people, um, like 99.9% .9 of people, are not going to want to touch anything here. So basically, what outbound NAT refers to is the basic operation of uh, NAT itself. Uh, when most people, of course, most people think about port forwarding when they go to configure NAT, but uh, NAT is most commonly used uh, on outgoing traffic, right? Whenever you make a connection from your LAN to your WAN, um, a, a state is created in the state table, right? There's an ephemeral port that's being used um, to uh, track that state. And then when the connection response comes back, um, you know, the port number and that state are used to convert the, uh, the uh, destination address into the LAN address. And so the traffic gets back to the device on the other side of your firewall. And so this is actually uh, what controls uh, that behavior. And uh, the default mode is uh, automatic rule generation. And this last rule here, this bottom rule, is what actually does that. So basically, uh, any traffic that comes in on any of the uh, interfaces on the box, so whether it be from the firewall itself or from uh, you know, your, your LAN or your optional interface, any traffic that comes in on that that's destined for the internet um, gets a random source port, so an, an ephemeral port, um, and it is sent out into uh, the internet. 
and you can uh, you can add sort of manual rules if you uh, want to. Um, you can uh, specify uh, how this mapping is done if you have some very strange application or some strange case where you want to do things. Um, you can uh, either go manual or hybrid and you can um, you can sort of manually edit these rules. But I recommend uh, staying away from this unless you absolutely know that you need this uh, because otherwise uh, you could risk breaking things. The last tab is NPT. And uh, as I've said before, I'm not going into IPv6, and this is a, an exclusively IPv6 feature, and so I'm not going to be discussing it uh, in this video series. So this just about covers the firewall. Um, realistically speaking, it's relatively straightforward. Um, as long as you know what to enter, um, you should be able to find all of the options that you need. Um, most people will ultimately just end up adding some port forwarding rules, and that's probably it. Um, of course, if you have extra interfaces, you're going to definitely need to uh, control the flow of traffic between your uh, LAN subnets. Um, but other than that, uh, it's basically, uh, it's, everything is done on a case-by-case -case basis, and so I unfortunately can't really go into many more specifics because I just, uh, you know, I, I don't know what your network is configured like. So hopefully this was uh, somewhat useful. And... Uh, as always, thanks for watching.